Are you ever frustrated that you can't find a way to bring the big feelings you get from others' art into your own art? Maybe you just need to train your analytic eye to level up your inferencing skills because being able to look at and identify the ideas behind the art can lend you insights to help you get back on track and feel more motivated to create again. And fortunately, Rob and I have been talking about this topic for a decade, and here we are again talking about it on a Lean Into Art mini workshop. Welcome to this Lean Into Artcast mini workshop episode where we explore an art or creative task and demonstrate how we think about it and work on it. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist. Hey, and I'm Rob Stensinger. I'm a user experience designer and interactive maker and a teaching artist. Good to see you again, How's it going, Rob. Jersey? It's going, hey. it's, it's going okay. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about this whole, this, 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 concept of the analytic eye and it's it's some language it's a metaphor we've been using for a long time but we've never sat down to really talk about like how we develop this idea or how we put it into use like how do you do analysis so we're gonna and and why even do it because like th there are some trade-offs it gets it's harder for me sometimes to get lost in story because I'm constantly anticipating what the storyteller is promising with every choice they make, you know? So uh, I, I'm not done watching WandaVision, but I was talking with a friend who had finished it, and I said, like, it seems like they're trying to do something with this character. He's like, well, pff, you figured out what they're doing with it. <laughs> like, well, I'm not, like, there's no pride in that. It's just like, that's the way I encounter story now all the time. It's like, I'm always anticipating where things are headed. So we're gonna do a live demonstration of how this works. And we're going to end with giving you an example to try and then maybe close with some wondering about like different applications of this idea. What we call in the, the world of education, uh, you know, like what, are they, what do they call it now? I'm losing the, the term, like modifications or uh, how would you apply this to different grade levels? Well, how would you apply this to different scenarios? Mm. So, I'm excited to talk about this with you. This is, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, clearly we've explored and practiced this for for a long time and and have talked about different trade-offs but this is an actual learning module this is how like we're saying like you've set this up so this is a way to practice this skill to make it practical to not just be like oh that's an, that these are interesting perspectives and how they're you know, you're sort of maybe just watching us put it to use but this is how you could put it to use so i think i'm, I'm excited because i remember first encountering this long time ago in one in your micro podcast and uh and it's it's been very useful so how exciting to help share this well i'm glad you're excited but if anybody else is wondering who this is for right well maybe it's for rob but not for me rob's one of them thinking types i'm one of those feeling types i just i think we're all thinking and feeling types <laughs> as i talk to this imaginary person but uh i have an anecdote that explains who this is for okay it's like Ooh. I was once sitting across the table from my collaborator, Tom Root, who I worked on a number of comics projects with in like the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, leading up to pay-per-view, my first miniseries. And I was trying, I was beginning to work on what was going to become the, my first graphic novel, The Front Rebirth. And I was trying to explain the main villain to Tom. And I went on for like two minutes and I wasn't saying anything. I was like, he's kind of like this, but he's kind of not like that. And he's kind of like this. He's kind of like, he feels big, but he feels small. And he's kind of angry, but he's not so angry. And then Tom was like, very, <laughs> Tom was the, the best collaborator to be this implacable Jack Kirby, um, you know, uh, force wall of just looking at me and not giving me any emotional response. And then finally quietly saying, you don't know who he is, do you? And I was like, no, I don't. And looking back, if, if I were to describe this that what was happening there is i had a feeling of what i wanted that villain to be i had a like this is what the character feels like when i imagine him but i didn't have language to put to it i couldn't articulate it and if i can't articulate it in that kind of setting how the heck am i going to, are going to articulate it in the story now maybe my first language is visual and i can do it that way and i can intuit it maybe but wouldn't it be better if you could also speak in another language too so that you can check yourself on this and add more, what we talked about last episode, informational redundancy into the story so that it's unambiguous, right? So 
there's that. It's it's for anybody who makes creative stuff. I think the analytic eye can be of a function to you. Um, and then somebody might be anticipating as they walk in, like, well, you're talking about art critique. I'm like, well, I would say this is related to, but it is distinct in that this is not about deciding whether or not the work is successful. When you're analyzing somebody else's work, now you're just analyzing what made it work on you just now. What did they do so that you felt something? So this is about identifying what moves you and putting it in an analysis bucket for future personal use, which is different than art critique, right? I agree. I would call it art architecture. Oh. So, yeah. I mean, because you're, you're trying to discern patterns and to, to, um, in, in concerns to create blueprints to, con to construct something intentionally. And that sounds like the behaviors and ideas of, of architect, of architecting. That's very cool. I did not make that connection. I'm so glad I do this project with you, Rob. So how about we take a break and then we'll come back and like actually demonstrate the, the skill of the analytic eye. What do you say? I love it. Let's take a break and then jump in. Okay. So if the work we do here at Liam's Heart helps you to think harder and do uh, more successful work on your own, a great way you can thank the show, thank the project is by supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Liam's Heart is the website. It's a way for, you can support us on an ongoing monthly basis for as little as a dollar a month. I want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that. Matt Zolman, thank you, Matt. And Ben Hamilton, thank you, Ben. And Susan Marks, it means a lot to us, Susan. Sarah Lutfi, thank you so much, Sarah. And Ashley Knapp, longtime supporter Ashley Knapp, thank you so much. You can join them all at patreon.com slash Lena to Art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. And get you access to the patreon only section of the lena to Art discord which is our chat room uh time shifted conversations between episodes and we just recently launched with a low introductory price of ten dollars the lean into art labs have you found the gentle creative project uh the gentle creative project pressure of a due date or demo day useful the lean into art monthly 90 minute lab session is a place where we host creative group professionals developing their projects We'll be there to encourage you to find new possibilities, and it's a place to work in the presence of others, whether you choose to share or hang back. Each session held on the third Thursday of every month is facilitated by one of the two hosts of Lena to Art, and both Rob and I have decades of experience in teaching and facilitation of creative groups and processes for all kinds of projects, and that's at patreon.com slash Lena to Art. You can check out the monthly labs there. Thanks to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It really does. Thank you so much. And just to mention and, and add on, uh, third Wednesday, there's... Um, Did I say Thursday? I keep doing that. It's the it's alliterative, it's alliterative. And I don't know, maybe maybe we should change the schedule. No. But, uh, yeah, it's the no, third Wednesday. I, it's you the don't... curse of alliteration. And it's, it's, it's wonderful <laughs> when, you, when you can have that. Because it's another way to sort of double encode and add a little bit of flair to something that makes it easy to memorize but we don't have that working for us in this case so uh, yes it, i also had it written down wrong in the copy so i just updated it to say wednesday i will do it properly from now on the third wednesday of every month is lean Heart lab okay here we go time to teach oh yeah <laughs> uh, it's i just in get all excited song. It's, it's talk about encoding. That's right there in the intro. You teach me and I'll teach you. Okay. So how do we get started? How do we prepare for this thing? Um, I'm going to say, if you're new to this idea of analyzing stuff, like in a thoughtful, methodical way, I would say, start with something small that you have a lot of familiarity with something that you have a lot of experience with so that there's not a whole lot of um, I, I do a, a lesson in my classroom where I have my students watch an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and then redesign the characters. And in that case, it's purposefully, I chose something that they don't have a lot of familiarity with. So they have to like really do a lot of inferencing and guess what the intentions were when these characters show up just for a few seconds at a time. I would say that's too much of a cognitive load to put on for something that you're just beginning to practice this with. Does that seem fair, Rob? I... Yeah, I think it does. You you may be working against assumptions and whatnot, but at least you have a lot of familiarity with that because um, because you can have art that's really affected you and you not knowing why, where you yes. just get sort of this. It's a it's a mystery. It's a building block. It's something to wonder and just but not know where where to go next. 
And and what's cool is like you can have something that's that um, wonderful, beautiful, and mysterious that you can that you you have a procedure to actually explore it. Yes, yeah, this is this is the antidote to the Chris Farley interview character, right? <laughs> when he's talking to Paul McCartney. Uh, Remember when you were uh, in the Beatles? Uh, oh, that was awesome, right? We're, we're, this is purposely yeah. designed to, to get you around that. So what are some of the things that you would recommend that we could choose from? Like, are, Just as like a general like cursory view of things we could p- potentially choose to analyze. Uh, I mean, just about any, any kind of creative um, thing you love, like it could be music or a particular, but pick a piece of music, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, not like a whole genre. You want to have one specific instance of, uh, could be a painting or, um, or a drawing, right? Mm-hmm. Illustration. Um, could be a podcast, I'm going to say. Like, yeah. how are they doing what they're doing? Yeah, I don't know actually, if I'd make it lean into art. You know, it's a, you're putting in some time there, but um, <laughs> you got the time. No. <laughs> yeah, I would say like if it was something where it, it has a, a a time duration, I would say like try to keep it on like twenty minutes or less, right? It's like an episode of a television show, nice. um, and, but not a movie, right? Especially not a Peter Jackson movie or the Zack Snyder movie, <laughs> <laughs> right? But yeah, yeah, your debut outing for <laughs> for practicing the analytical eye procedure. You know, it may be wonderful, but yeah, probably not uh, Lord of the Rings or Justice League. Sorry. Um, right. <laughs> you're asking for a lot of trouble because you want to complete the experience, right? You want to yeah. go through all the steps and uh, yeah, uh, more bite sized the art, the, the easier you can go through all the steps. Yeah. So you know, a single yeah. comic book, right? Um, or I if like, you're going to, pl- yeah, go ahead. I like how you, you know, you mentioned a game also like, um, in, in the notes where the, um, you know, you don't have to solve a whole game. Just put yourself through a session that, you know, set a timer could be, yeah, like you said, 20 minutes and, uh, there you go. Now you have a bite size experience to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the analysis that we're going to do is going to be very bite-sized in its approach too. And, but I would say that this is a framework when we get into like modifications, extensions at the end with our wonderings, that was the teaching term I was trying to think of earlier. Um, Hmm. you can turn it into a broader scope view, but I'm going to look at like very microcosm, uh, like a small sort of manageable way to, to go about this. And I think a way to do it uh, for the, the demonstration is to talk about uh, this project I do called the 4 Million Years Later podcast, where that is the explicit job that I have on the show, is watch a 21-minute episode of Transformers and then analyze the story and talk about like what parts work, which parts, which parts moved me, which parts didn't move me, right? And how what I anticipated and what I was disappointed by and what I would have liked to have seen, that kind of thing. So... Which- is an excellent show that you should subscribe to because you will get so much nourish, nourishing demonstration of storytelling analysis and, um, and, and, and exploring all kinds of layers of it, it you know, from the voice acting and the performances and the visuals, the, um, the, 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 the effect of animation and choices there. Like, and, and of course, plot and writing, Mm-hmm. dialogue, character analysis. I mean, this is a, a, a very specific hands-on tour of, I mean, it's like a story workshop every, every episode. Yeah, it kind of is. It, yeah. So I, I want to talk specifically about ep- ep- episode seven of the, of the podcast, which was where we talked about an episode called Fire in the Sky, which this wound up becoming one of our longest episodes because I had so much to say in it. Um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of... So let me get back to where we are. There's me and Rob. Okay, so what's the first step once you picked your thing? Is like experience it. And then um, I would say try to pay attention to the emotional responses that you have when encountering the art. Now, you and I have both done mindful meditation before, right? So, mm-hmm. and in that, I'm reminded of this fact that like in mindful meditation, it's really a lot of it is about like paying attention to your body. Right. Like when I did it seriously, it was like I did the version where you're mostly just like listening to your breathing and like not counting your breaths, but like really like inhale through the nose, out through the mouth, really focus your attention on your stomach as it rises and falls during the the, um, the meditation process. Right. So mm-hmm. 
listening to your body is a learnable skill. And, and, and listening to your body in sort of not a, not a broad brush way of, you know, Hey, hey, what's up? I'm cool. You know, it's, (laughs) it's, uh, breathing has a lot of elements to it. And if so, so to have giving yourself a chance to, to have a more specific vocabulary about something that you could generalize is, uh, the, yeah, I mean, meditation is a really good, um, concrete example of, of, of practicing. Yeah. So this, and this is all to point out that like, if, if you were to say, like, if I were to ask you right now, whoever's listening or watching, like quick gut check, how do you feel right now? And you're like, I don't know, fine. Believe me. I'm there with you. I, 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 I sometimes check in with my friends. They ask me, how you been? How you been? I'm like, I guess. Okay. I think, I don't know. I haven't checked with myself, you know? So, but it is a learnable skill. It's, this is the, and so the first thing is to like, sort of like adjust yourself to this idea that you are going to listen to your body when you're experiencing the thing. You get to listen for reactions. Um, and then can you describe that feeling with some precision and specificity? You know, what were you doing with your body when you felt that emotion? Right. Um, was it a big, was it, did you feel bigger? Did you feel smaller? Were you sweating? Were you crying? Were you laughing? Were you bemused? Were you, did, you, did you find your body pulled in? Were you crossing your arms? Right. Um, could be subtle too. Right. Could be mm-hmm. that whole, your tongue is tense as heck. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, um, the just, uh, you, when, when you tense up, there's, di- there's s- s- almost infinite ways to tense up. <laughs> and, yeah. but just noticing, noticing that where, where all of a sudden something, uh, and I've had this happen in positive things where it just being so, um, arrested by watching something where it's like, I'm not breathing very much and I'm sitting in a weird posture because I just froze myself like freeze tag. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm like, Oh wait. <laughs> okay. So yeah. you can know there's so many things, right? The, the cla- classics, I, I like, yeah, arms crossed. Yeah. Black. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've, I've had it happen where I didn't notice it until it, until it was like, it really exaggerated. Like in uh, one of the new star Wars movies, something bad happens to Chewbacca early on in the story. And then when it's revealed that no Chewbacca is okay, I literally sp- almost spilled out of the chair and I didn't realize my body was that tensed up, but like the, re- the release was so complete that my body almost became gelatin, you know? So, yeah. Wow. I love Chewbacca, man. All right. So then the other thing to look for, to pay attention for when you're doing this is identify any aesthetic responses that you have when encountering the art. So I would describe the way I feel in aesthetic responses is, did it make me pause? Did I stop and I'm no longer in the flow with the story, but I'm like, what just happened there? I just saw something and maybe I don't have like precise words for it, but it, it's a moment that visually asks me or, or auditorially, whatever sensory organ you're using to experience this thing, it makes you, it makes you sit up a little bit. You suddenly are more alert to what you're like, and you're aware that you're experiencing something, which is different than an emotional response. An aesthetic response is something where you're sort of gripped by, um, skillful art, right? Do you write that down or is it just sort of you, you, you notice and move on? So I would say I, I notice and move on. But if it like in the case of like the 4 million years later podcast, what I do with that is I do a screen grab. Like anytime I have that moment, I get to do a screen grab and I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I just like, you know, urgent grab, urgent capture, put it in a bucket. I'm going to look at these afterwards and then I'm going to ask myself, why did they grab me? Right. So it's a little bit, uh, it's like a scrapbooking kind of thing or, or where, but it's, it's, it's either just making a a special moment to hold into your memory, Mm -hmm. you know, better than, than if, if you didn't let that become a real moment, uh, and, uh, or, or yeah, like just a visual collage kind of thing. That's very interesting. And obviously it would be different with audio, right? So it might be something where you just like, take a quick note, like at this timestamp, Right at this time, mm-hmm. it, where like when it switched from this to that, when mm-hmm. Eddie Van Halen started doing the finger tapping, right? Um, whatever it is that like makes you stay. <laughs> did, did I just see you, Rob? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. I what? Sure. So first time I heard Eddie Eddie Van Halen, um, you know, finger tapping. I'm sure I sat there with my mouth agape. I was like, yeah, uh, and just. <laughs> whatever i'm like wow someone someone took up resonance in my brain and held all the attention said it's mine now you know yeah (laughs) so 
yeah so whatever the whatever the creative thing you're experiencing it's when you you notice that they've got they've gotten all of your attention they've made you more focused and you lean in in a way uh, so with that in mind let's go through uh, this shouldn't take that long actually um is the middle the the making progress steps like the sort of like once you're midway into it you've you're experiencing the thing the frame that i think would be functional for this is to ask yourself what came before during and after the emotional or aesthetic arrest okay so whenever you felt the feeling or whenever you felt yourself pause what came just before that what was what was happening when you were arrested either emotionally or, or aesthetically and then what was was there anything that it, that is related to that that came immediately after that this tiny little window of experience in that moment let's just look do a quick spin around and look at all the details when we're in the midst of that feeling does that make sense oh it does i love these ideas that it's a whole vocabulary coming out in this episode it's like we're making concrete this thing and i love it the a window <laughs> of experience of having a, bef a before a during and an after super yeah. useful Right? And yes, and yeah, when we get to extensions modifications, we'll see how that can be much more broad. But I think that for for a you know if you're not if you don't do this a lot, this is the functional way to approach it. So with that in mind, how about I switch to putting on the episode "Fire in the Sky" in the background, so we just see like the context. And so I would say, what was an emotional response? We're looking at it right now. Um, Starscream uh, is ordering Skyfire, this new Decepticon to literally assassinate defenseless Autobots, right? And they, the, the, mm. the tensions rise, Starscream gets angry. He's like, I'm ordering you to do it. And, and you know, Skyfire says, I will not, they've done no wrong. And so Starscream turns on him. So what came before? Mm. So in the story, so like, okay, so here's the shot. He shoots, he shoots his friend, right? And then even the Autobots are like shocked. Like, oh, I can't believe you did that. And then Starscream turns on the Autobots and murders them. <laughs> And then they got to a commercial break, right? This moment when I was a child, like really hung in my head. And I didn't know why. I didn't really think about it all that much beyond like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was so upsetting and so powerful. So let's look at what came before, what came during, and what came after. So what came before? It was revealed earlier in the episode that he and Starscream were old friends before the Autobot Decepticon War. They were both scientist explorers. And then they were on an exploratory mission and Skyfire got lost and you know frozen in ice for millions of years. And Starscream says in the, the episode, uh, I searched half the globe for him, but he was gone. But then Starscream found him again and resuscitates him, brings him back, right? So you have a friendship between these two characters and a trust but then what came during? Skyfire refused his friend, citing his function as a scientist. I'm a scientist, not an executioner. And what came after? You know, Starscream, feeling betrayed, shoots and wounds him almost fatally. Okay? So now it's time to an an analyze. I looked at what came before, what came during, what came after. Let's, let's break it down and unpack it to find out why did this moment make me feel these big emotions? So you have old, old friends reunited, reunited in a new context. See, we're abstracting this out now, not talking about the specific details of Starscream as a jet and a Decepticon and, you know, uh, Jetfire is a bigger jet or Skyfire is a bigger jet and he's, you know, white and red. None of those details matter. We're abstracting it out to just like, like sort of like the, the broadest possible facts. Um, their old friends were united in a new context. One friend has changed though, right? Skyfire is still a scientist, but Starscream has changed his function of being a warrior, right? And the restored friend has to find his way in this new situation. The one person he could trust is behaving strangely, right? Um, he says to Starscream, he's like, are you happier being a warrior than a scientist? And Starscream's like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's way more exciting. And Skyfire's like, I, I don't get it. I'm, I, and he says repeatedly episode, I don't understand, you know? And so the restored friend has only one thing to fall back on, his principle, right? He says, my function is to further science and learning. Well, that's his function. That sounds like itself, it's, it's imposed from the outside, but he keeps talking about it like it's an inner principle, right? This is something he believes in. And so he has to go to his principle to make decisions. And that decision has a cost because when he stands by it, you know, his friend turns on him and shoots him, right? Wow. Yeah. So to be able to uh, break this down into the, those different uh, portions 
Now, um, yeah, the analysis time with what you're doing there, um, it's like you're, it's like you're digging in and you're sort of un, like the, the ideas, um, metaphor is often described in design and collaboration is unpacking mm-hmm. and trying to, yeah. Um, so, so now you're really noticing stuff about what you noticed, right? Yeah. How yeah. Interesting. And, and, and yeah. I mean, this is based on like an, another old st- like story analysis principles. Like, can you describe the character without talking about what their job is or what they mm-hmm. look like, you know, cause really you're just talking about like, what's the personality and the relationships between these characters. And is that coming through? So that's why I was specifically trying to talk, like in analysis time, I'm like trying to break away. Like I'm not thinking about Starscream as a a specific person. Now I'm thinking about the performance, the role that he explores in this relationship with this other character, Skyfire. Right. Mm. Um, Yeah. That role kind of analysis is different than uh, thinking of, of the, yeah, like visual design and and things like that. Um, Mm. The, it, it, would they, would you ever get caught in in a, in a little bit of a in between like um, the the act, the acting the visual like the perf- the performance of what you're seeing does that ever get tied into this or anything well, else that as far as this this kind of analysis that that would help? yeah you're you're right I like in this case the what the example that I'm citing there um, I'm really talking more about like what happens in the story. Right. I'm talking about like story events, but there's there's more layers to it. Right. There's also Greg Berger's performance as Skyfire. He does this really great job of having this kind of low measured, um, thoughtful voice. Starscream, played by Chris Lotta, has this really high pitched, nasally, arrogant, aggressive voice. Right. So when Starscream says, you know, like like when Skyfire says, I will not, they have done no wrong. Starscream's like, but you have traitor and shoots him, right? Like there's <laughs> there's a distinction drawn even in the performance of the actors. And there's a there's a distinction drawn in the performance of the animation too. Right. Because we'll talk about that when we get to like talking about like aesthet- what happens when I have aesthetic arrest watching something. Mm-hmm. Um hmm. so there's lots of when you're doing that analysis, you can back away and say, like, okay, well. I've got this this um, journey of two characters that I'm watching that's making me feel big feelings. But then also, can I ask, what are the other layers that are contributing to this? Why do they feel so different now, right? Um, why, how does, how does the explore, exploration of the cost paid for Skyfire sticking to his principle, how is that expressed in the visuals, in the... Uh, you know, in the performance of the actors, even the fact that they take a moment to say after Starscream says, you have traitor and he shoots him and, and Skyfire falls down. We saw in the animation, they do a slow pan watching the Autobots horrified faces after he does that, even though they're about to be assassinated, they are moved by the act of betrayal that Starscream has committed, even though Starscream feels like he's the one who's been betrayed. Right. So mm. it's, it's looking at all the pieces. What did they show? What did they hide? What did we not see? What did we see? And then the next question that I ask myself, at least with this project four million years later, is how do I think these choices contributed to the overall narrative or meaning of the piece? And how does that design support the intended audience, right? This is a story about giant robots punching and shooting each other, right? But it's also for little kids, and these writers were trying their best to make something that was like useful for little kids. And so it's the exploration of relationship building and friendship building and when is it time to not be friends with somebody anymore right that's a tough that is tough for anybody any age to sit to know when it's time to not be friends with somebody right sometimes those like those those this is decisions are made very easily for us but um or made easy for us but in this case it's a story about somebody who has a principle and he uses that principle as a guiding um device to help him navigate where he belongs in the world, right? Um, hmm. And maybe that story is not appropriate for somebody who's thirty-five, right? Maybe it is, but you know, I it was appropriate for me. I still love it. I still get extremely emotional when I talk about that story. But the intended audience was eleven-year-old kids. Well, they're they're yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's an interesting question to have come up, and. Uh, 
noticing what you notice and also like adjacent things, which I'm, I'm sure we can get into in the in modification uh, mm-hmm. uh, aspect. But the, it, that I think that's that is interesting and, and, and useful, because if you're trying to understand this and uh, uh, you're going to uh, just instinctively have some questions. And like you said, well, is this appropriate for someone, you know, of a, you know, that's out of the target age group for this, you know, media and, and it, um, yeah, I mean, interesting question. And, and then well, so some stories that's like, you could, you know, would, would say like, oh no, I need to have that. Um, I need to manage that as a concern because I want parents to watch this with their kids or what have you. And, you know, different, yeah. different signals can get embedded where, yeah, no, uh, noticing new things about pri- prior things you would, you'd, ex- you'd experienced. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, yeah, whenever stories have older characters, now I'm, a, uh, now I'm learning way more from those characters, uh, <laughs> that, that it's like, Oh, look at that parallel perspectives going on. Anyway, um, kind of related, but, um, but the, it's like the, like there's layers and, and, and as you, as you observe and infer and notice and sort of, you know, describe how your, your experience of experiencing this. Um, I, yeah, I think it's interesting yeah, that you will have other questions come up and worth yeah. knowing in my, I would for yeah. sure write that kind of thing down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those questions naturally come up for me because part of my goal with this kind of analysis is to gather information that I could potentially act upon in my own work later on. Um, understanding how like the the underlying structure and the purpose of these visual choices, character action choices, and performance choices um, gives me more tools in my you know my pencil case to, to employ on the uh, and again, that's what, another reason why you abstract it out too, is that because it's like I'm not just going to say like, well, I want to do a story like that. So okay, I got the story about a guy who's a jet. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, I could tell the same story, but like with very different kind of creatures and, and contexts. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. so I want to talk about aesthetic too, like aesthetic, uh, because there's this, again, using the Transformers only as a um, case in point, a modeling exercise, is they it almost eternally re-release different editions of Optimus Prime and Megatron toys where Optimus has an, a go, uh, an orange axe hand and Megatron has a purple um, chain and, and mace hand. Have you seen these, Rob? Um, I have, yeah. They come out enough that, that where it's like, it seems like everybody's hung up on this mo- one moment. It was like three minutes of animation in the very first episode where Optimus and Megatron fight on a dam and Optimus pulls his hand to his arm and out comes this glowing orange axe and Megatron does the same and it's got this purple mace. It never happens again in the series. Never. But it's it's become this emblematic thing where if you make a fancy edition of an Optimus Prime toy, he's coming with that axe. <laughs> and it can only point to the fact that to a generation of fans, that moment aesthetically arrested us. We were all captured by how visually cool it was to watch that fight on top of that dam. Otherwise, why else would they come with all with those, those accessories every darn time they re-release them, you know? So that's what I'm talking about is this idea. Like there's these moments where it's something like we, we described it, like where it captures your attention. So I'm back to the episode. Let me go to this moment. This is like a moment where I experienced some aesthetic arrest in the episode, which was where Megatron Optimus are fighting and then they grab the, from this giant crystal pieces of crystal and start sword fighting. And then we see Megatron does this little ninjutsu move here where he uses the fact that he can turn his waist all the way around to like pull that special move of Optimus. Then Optimus spins his hand like a rotor to like knock Megatron down and breaks his sword, right? So what, okay, I had my moment of rest. Like th- this is something where I talked about this moment among friends for decades afterwards. Remember that cool sword fight between Optimus and Megatron? Wasn't it amazing? You can look at the animation. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's not, It's not. you know, uh, Miyazaki. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but it was, it was interesting looking. Anyway, so mm-hmm. what came before? Historically speaking, and even in this episode, most of the fighting that happened was with laser guns. They, they have one, one side's over here shooting lasers, one side's over there shooting lasers. They're robots with laser guns. That has been traditionally, and I would say 99.9% of the time, the premise of how battle works in this cartoon. 
What mm. came during? They use their environment, the giant crystal that they're fighting around, as and their unique abilities, Megatron's ability to spin his waist, Optimus' ability to spin his hand, to morph and engage, uh, their unique abilities to morph, to engage in an imaginative battle. That's the language I use, use in the, in the uh, podcast, is this idea of like imaginative battle scenes. And what came after? This aspect of the show went away after some time. So like it, this feels even more unique. It feels like it's very of its time in the sense that it's a season one episode. And in season one, they play with this idea of like what kind of imaginative ways can they have these characters fight. But then a Joe Coover and I make on the show is that uh, by season two, we're really at this scenario where uh Optimus and Megatron just stand across an alleyway and just shoot lasers back and forth, right? And we sort of mourn the more imaginative fight scenes. So analysis time, you know, it's like the introduction of premise, uh, introduction of premise and standard operating procedure in the story. You start with, this is the way the story functions. And then these creative writers thought about like breaking the rules and like how, how the premise and the characters, uh, unique abilities and shortcomings might introduce surprise into your art. Someone had the th presence of mind to say, well, look, they're robots and they can spin all their parts around and turn into another whole thing. So why couldn't they use that morphing ability to make parts of their bodies do other things? Like when Megatron flips his waist around so that he can swing his sword around like more fiercely at Optimus, right? And delightful surprise often feels obvious when we encounter it. Like when we see, when we encounter delightful surprise, like, oh, of course, why wouldn't it work that way, right? Oh, I should have seen it. It was there, right? And that's, I think, why that moment arrested me. Because it was cool, but it didn't feel uh, out of place. It didn't feel out of the context of what we had experienced so far. So, hmm. and that, once again, has nothing to do with trucks and guns and robots and planes. It has to do with this idea of like, well, look at your premise, look at the the characters you have, and what are their shortcomings, what are their abilities, what are they, what are their pros and cons? Can you play with that to work against the premise to introduce delightful surprise? That okay? It's it's really you have a whole lot of um, really useful you know vocabulary and observations that you 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 layer on it right where it can you can go from the, you know, wow, this was this, I, I just said, wow, I saw a thing and it's, it's like, it, it's affecting me, but then notice like, well, there's not a, there's not as much to this as far as, um, like areas of concern I could analyze that, that the information that's being, you know, transmitted, it's a, it, it's like, it's, it's a sword fight. Right. But in the, in, in a certain context, it it has um it's it, it's having an impact and so yeah aesthetic choices can have impacts and that's I, I, that's you know an incredibly useful thing to point out uh, as a kind of thing to an analyze um and, and just sort of but yet an aesthetic um impact can still have a lot of parts to it right where you're describing the um in a way the the context of the audience right what you experienced before uh feeds into the contrast of like what you know, the surprise, it, w it wouldn't have been surprising if it was always, you know, an option before. Mm -hmm. So like, how do right. you go to something that is like, if you're asking yourself, um, why, um, I like this, this is, this is really, uh, compelling for me, but there's not a lot to it. It's, it's aesthetic and that's good. I want to do aesthetic, aesthetically interesting things too. Um, and that's anyway, it's like a, a, a useful, uh, portion of the analysis. Cause again, like we, I, I, I pointed out how there's a, in a way you're, you're, you're like point out architectural patterns for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And then part of architecture is, um, well, the, the design of, of, you know, what, what is then layered upon this other stuff, right? Cause that fight out of nowhere would have probably, uh, um, created a moment of aesthetic arrest. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but that fight in the context of the story and then all of a sudden, aha, it's a punctuating, um, clever thing. Uh, right. And, 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 and putting it in the context of what came after in a broader sense of like when I watch other episodes, I understand now why, say, uh, 
the insecticon syndrome, just naming an episode out of the, out of pulling a name out of a hat. Like now I know why that one, I don't remember the battle scene because there was nothing that grabbed me the way that that surprise grabbed me as a child. Right. So, and then I look at that other episode and it's literally them standing across a, a you know, like some kind of chasm shooting lasers at one another. And they, there's in Hoover and I even, you know, sort of like to start to do send ups about it where they'll, we'll like do a screen capture of of the wide pan of just like still Autobots standing there holding guns. And just the only thing that's animated is the lasers coming out as they're doing a pan. You know, it's like, OK, well, we're at a different level of animation now. We have a different budget that we're working on. We have different uh, con- different writers who have different tastes and different uh, assumptions about this series. So how does that all contribute to this to make a different product, right? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so yeah. So like this is the kind of way I'm thinking all the time when I'm consuming media is I'm watching what is happening on the screen or what I'm listening to or what I'm reading in front of me, and I begin inferring and predicting what was the purpose of putting that there. Like especially if it if it grabs me if if it gives me pause either emotionally or aesthetically. And then I go through that little cycle of, okay, what came before what's happening right now and what happened right after that? That'll give me some kind of clues to begin peeling this apart. Um, in other words, I'm doing a very, very narrow context gather, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I'm walking with a very small basket going context, please give me some context. And then I put it in the basket so then I can put together some larger meaning out of like why this thing arrested me. So, what do you do with that though, right? So I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on like ways to put that into action? I know you do the same kind of analysis and research. Well, it's, uh, I mean, I, yes. I mean, for every, every kind of uh, creative discipline I practice, I try to, I try to be um, intentional about, well, okay, I need to create, um, you know, I'm creating an article, uh, so... I'll be thinking about it, you know, pulling this off with, with prose and writing I, or creating an illustration, uh, a, a sing, you know, accomplishing, you know, a lot of things with a single image. And, um, then, uh, drawing upon this, uh, you know, this practice of, of analysis is what helps me have a vocabulary and references to then incorporate, um, well, okay, I, I understand the goals. How am I going to get there? And this lets me collect how, and, um, that's, yeah, I mean, that, that, that is, I think, you know, like it, it lets you not be stuck. It lets you not be looking at a blank page and saying, what do I do and where do I go? It's, it's, you, you have architectural patterns in your own collection of, of sort of story and visual solutions to, um, get you to accomplish an outcome. Um, so where, um, yeah, what what are you thinking as far as uh, uh, you know you 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 talked about you demonstrated explored the procedure mm-hmm. of of the whole you know noticing and the before during and after a couple examples of that um, what um, where do you want to go next with that Well, uh, yeah, I just I thought we should conclude before we take another break. Uh, with mm-hmm. this whole and, and giving everybody a, a, a way to practice it themselves is that mm. I think something we both do a lot and we talk about a lot in, in this podcast is uh, reflection. A way to integrate and synthesize the experience is to reflect on it in some kind of meaningful mm-hmm. way. And that reflection can take a lot of forms. We do all kinds of reflection individually through this pro- this project called Lean Into Art, right? Um, so do you write it down in a journal? Do you do like a little audio recording into otter.ai? They don't sponsor us, but they should. Um, mm-hmm. Do you make a mm-hmm. microcast out of it, right? Um, Art Sound Off will be here before we know it. Boy, wouldn't it be cool to do that as, a, as an experiment, is do like an, a story analysis, 30 days of story analysis, or music analysis, food analysis, whatever it is. Um, That's a really good point. Yes, I very, like, I, I get... I get that now where I, I do want to capture if I learn a thing from this, this practice of observing and whatnot, uh, I want to make it easier to remember. I want to sort of nourish future me with this insight. And, um, so wherever makes sense yeah. for you could be a notebook, a scrapbook, uh, a series of, of screen captures, um, 
Yep. But you you're you're creating your own sort of um, external brain portfolio collection of of this kind of insight wherever yeah. works for you. Yep. Yeah, and and that you know it's like that's so you don't have to remember it. <laughs> so you have more cycles open to do the analysis the next time. Mm. So okay, how about we take a couple minute break, talk about some other ways people can support the show, and in we'll come back with a way that everybody can try this for themselves. Like where where do we go next to do it? How's that sound? That sounds awesome. Yeah. Good good to summarize and help make this extra portable. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so if this is helping you think and do useful things with your art, a great way you can support us and let us know that it's meaningful to you is interact with the stuff that we make. And the thing that I make that I hope you will interact with is the 4 Million Years Later podcast. Uh, what is it? Well, we've just been talking about it. You should know what it is by now. But here's, here's the uh, sort of abstract view of it. it. It answers the question, does creativity thrive in freedom? or in constraints. It's a story analysis podcast wherein the subject of study is the 1980s Transformers cartoon where we watch an episode a week and dig deep to explore the story's structure and meaning. We infer the writer's intentions and synthesize them with the context of conflicting needs of a daily television show explicitly designed to advertise toys. I know it's a commercial, everybody. I know that. But the people behind the scenes were trying to also make a great entertainment. And it, it has been a joyful experience. We're 60 episodes in now. Uh, it's at 4millionyearslater.com. And I love showing up every week to like think hard on why would they choose to put that there and not that? Why do they not show me this, but then show me that? As a matter of fact, episode 60, Cosmic Rust, there's a lot of them not showing something to really activate our imaginations. Um, so yeah, you can find it in podcatchers everywhere. So, Rob? Well, and a way to support the show to, um, you know, get one of my products in, I'm going to highlight listening like a coach. You can say, well, I already know how to listen, Rob, and, <laughs> and I'm not a coach. But you can be in sort of the situation where, you know, someone's asking you for advice, but they don't want a prescription. Or if someone wants to bounce ideas off of you, and they're they're going to make a decision, but it's not really your job to make it for them, right? It's, it's their cr uh, creative path. Well, the style of listening that I'm talking about is, um, is coaching that helps you navigate uh, with them and, but not for them. You're not prescribing what they should do. And that's what this workshop teaches is basic and advanced methods for coaching conversations. And it's uh, a series of videos it's um, a little over an hour long and it includes some activity workbook stuff and you can connect with your own experiences of when listening's worked for you and all that to really make this concrete and practical. You can get your copy of Listening Like a Coach at gum.co slash L-L-A-C-W-S. That short URL is gum.co slash L-L-A-C-W-S and get your copy of Listening Like a Coach. Uh, there we go. There and you. I would also, I would say that does, doesn't that workshop sort of take what you would do with analytic eye and help other people find their analytic eye, right? Helping them. It's very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's another, it's another way to practice being fluent with yeah, because in, in with your analytic eye, you're, you're, you're taking things in, noticing their effect on you. And part of listening like a coach is as having an instinctual conversation where you're doing so much listening and all of a sudden something that someone says, you're like, hey, OK, so tell me more about that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And and uh, one of it actually um, features uh, a portion of one of the episodes of Lean Into Art a while back where you and I have had had a real coaching conversation together and it sort of um, is commentary and analysis of that is part of the practical way to connect with this, this real skill. But yeah, analytic eye is a very useful thing. Um, like when I, I noticing that the dynamic, so you, you collect these dynamics and building blocks and stuff and 
so for me, I mean, I've practiced visual design, storytelling, interactive design and development and UX, whatever, all these different things. And it's, it's a big soup of experiences. But one thing I notice is patterns about making stuff is something I care deeply about. And so as Jersey's describing his approach to analytic eye, I noticed that this is a type of architecture. It's a type of architectural skill. Mm-hmm. So that I think is useful where you, um, yeah. And if it comes up, I'll, I'll, I'll make it more, more concrete. But uh, so like a, a flying buttress has a specific function, but where mm-hmm. you put it and what aesthetics you put on top of it can vary wildly. And you can, can you take a flying buttress and do something that outside of its traditional use, right? And then mm-hmm. to create and delight and surprise, those kinds of things, right? Yeah, I, I, I can see uh, that metaphor being really applicable to what I'm talking about. It's like noticing the structural functioning of these different pieces, yeah. That is because, and there's a lot of, th- um, there are different kinds of things that go into the structure. And so for me, my practice, I've practiced uh, a lot of software architecture, um, how you organize interactive systems in behind the scenes and how they're built and function. It's that's where I'm, I'm drawing that metaphor from, but also, you know, a little bit of casual study of, of actual architecture, you know, like physical building stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but practical experience is mostly software architecture. Um, because in, okay. So, so like you, mo- uh, you mentioned the before, during, after. So the dimension of time in analysis is powerful. The dimension of place in analysis is powerful. So noticing like the concept, like the literal or conceptual landscape and where things are pl- and how they're placed and how they're used. Noticing the roles of people, noticing the behaviors you expect in those roles. And, you know, and th- like, I was like, wow, this is totally, yeah. Uh, anyway, the c- concept after concept to me in my biases seem like we're teaching in a way, a kind of, um, uh, a discipline of, of, of story architecture mm. and not to the and, and, but what's interesting, it's not the prescriptive of, and then here's our exact approach. It's saying like, here's how you become, uh, you develop your own architectural vocabulary for, for mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Whereas a book like Robert McKee's story is very much his specific architecture for story. Right. I was going to say, yeah, we're not doing save the cat here. We're, we're saying, here's how you write your own mm. save the cat. Right. Right. Save yourself. Save your, yeah. Save your ideas. You get, <laughs> save your analytic eye. <laughs> um, <I don't. laughs> yeah. And actually, yeah. Something else we didn't really dig into deeply was how sequence, like the order matters. And I have a whole workshop that I do called sequences and consequences, which I should bring back for the mini workshop series um, that teaches that very principle of like the order in which you show things changes the meaning of the thing, whether in terms of like, you know, the information that I put together of like the, the plot meaning or also the emotional impact, like showing things in this order versus that order changes how it feels. So anyway, uh, but we, we promised that we're going to give everybody a, a, you know, an example to use for themselves. And, you know, it's like, I would say we said at the very top, it's this idea of like, you know, pick something that you have a lot of familiarity with to start with, right? Um, and that could be a lot of different things. It could be music illustration, a, a comic book, 20 minutes of gameplay. Uh, you pick the thing that you feel like analyzing, that you feel like you, you've gotten a lot of emotional charge out of, or you found yourself really wrapped up in the way it the looks and feels. Um, and then have a 20 minute interaction with it and look for those moments. Uh, what do you look for? What, you know, like, uh, whether you're having an aesthetic or emotional response, what do you need? You know, well, you need the media and you need something to capture your reflections, pencils, paper, recording device. Um, notice when you're feeling an emotion, notice when you pause to enjoy the skill and then ask yourself whenever that happens, whenever there's that spike in your, your cardiogram, You know, what came before, during, and after in the art. And then capture and reflect. I would even suggest it might be a good idea to just like take a walk and think about the experience first before you commit it to something, uh, if you have the space to do that. But if you don't, jot it down someplace, capture it in a journal, capture the reflection somehow. And then even better yet, talk about it with a friend or people in your community. Have a conversation about it because that to hear how they respond to your reflection will give you some more information about like, you know, how well you're articulating that reflection. 
So. Hmm. So that, I mean, the, I don't know, like, how do you feel, how do you feel about this and the analytic eye? I, you, you demonstrated how other people can do it. Like, and, and it's, it wasn't just putting it to use, um, in, a, in an application. And so, you know, one could infer and observe that oh, process. Yeah. But yeah. 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 So like how, like, how do you like use it in your work then? Right. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I, so sure, exactly. So, um, you know, uh, putting it to use or even having turned this into a learning uh, module and like where, yeah, yeah, where do you want to go next? Uh, I, I feel like that was a pretty good walk around the, the, the activity of doing the analysis. It would be a good idea to, I think, later on do a workshop on how do you actually employ all that analytical thinking? What do you do when you got these buckets of analysis and how have we both sort of put them into use? Because of the thinking I did about this, I can now do that, right? And I would argue, to put it succinctly, and if people want more on this topic, they can always message us on uh, our, you know, our Discord, leanintoheart.com slash Discord, uh, in the comments channel. Let us know if you want more of this. But um, I would say the fact that my, anybody who's read my comics, and if you've ever felt like my characters are very vibrant and unambiguous as to what they want out of life and how they how they feel about one another. It's because I've done this. It's because I've done all this thinking about these old cartoons of my youth, and I want to make stories for that age group too. So, and I, I had the wonderful experience where a friend of mine recently started watching the GI Joe cartoon for the first time. He's our age, and he never watched GI Joe, and he said like, "Oh, it's." influence on you is clear i'm like well what do you mean he's like well all the characters are just telling you exactly who they are in four words or less in all the dialogue i'm like well yeah that's something that i spent a lot of time parsing and thinking about like why do i love shipwreck so much <laughs> well when i watch the show and i think hard about those moments where i feel the big feeling what did he do right mm -hmm. so so yeah I, I i would say that you know, these things can infiltrate your work and inform your work in a way to where when somebody sees what you've been picking apart, they'll know that like, okay, they see the etymology of, of how you got to be where you are. So, mm. uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, I think we did another workshop. So thanks, Rob. Well, thank you, Jersey. Um, so let's all give, give it a try, try some analysis and let us know how it goes for you in the Lena Tart discord. Um, and please consider liking and subscribing, you know, liking the video helps more people find it. If you're listening to it in a podcatcher, giving us a review or a five-star rating helps more people find it. And you can always find us at lenatoart.com and patreon.com slash lenatoart. So thanks everybody. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of lenatoart.com and rss.jdrozd.com. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com. And you can check out my blog at interactive-storyteller.com. Say, okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.